have you failed your multi-state bar exam? If so, it probably feels like you're in that maze behind me trying to find your way through to the magic end and you just can't get there. My name is Jackson Mummy and for over 30 years I've helped people successfully pass their exams and in this video I'm going to show you why you failed and what you can do differently when it comes to the multi-state bar exam. to you today about a difficult subject and that is why you failed the multi-state bar exam. I know that's a provocative title and it may put some of you off but the reality is that we see more and more people failing the multi-state who are repeat bar takers. I want to be clear if you're a first-time bar taker the odds are still more in your favor just slightly that you'll pass the multi-state than fail it but not by a large margin. The national pass rates on the exam are just barely over 50%. Uh, for first-time takers, they can go sometimes as high as 70%, which is good news. And the overall numbers on the multi-state bar exam uh, are still trending upward over the last exam or two, which is great news. We're pleased about that. But as those big numbers are happening, we also see a counter trend occurring, and that is that repeat bar takers are actually staying the same or getting worse on the multi-state uh, nationally. That's what the statistics are telling us. And I thought that it would be useful to talk about four things that I think are causing people who fail the multi-state, the MBE, to be in that position. So I'm going to go through these and talk about them. I'm going to offer some solutions as we go through. And I recognize that it's important uh, to be objective about this. And some of you may feel very embarrassed about scores if you've been someone that's failed the MBE. You may feel like we're actually trying to test shame you in some way. That's not what we're doing at all. We just want to give you some accurate information and help demystify and demythalize. Uh, is mythalize a word? Probably not. But I want to uh, take the mythology out of the bar exam a little bit because there's so much bad information that's out there. So let's jump right into the first reason. For a lot of people, the reason that they failed at the multi-state is that they simply don't understand the test. They don't really know what the test is about, what it's trying to accomplish or achieve, and as a result, they make a lot of mistakes that could be avoided. So let me give you some examples of the kinds of things that lead to a misunderstanding of the test. The first, in my mind, is misunderstanding the structure of the exam. A lot of people seem to think that all of the tests on the, or all the questions on the multi-state are of an equal degree of difficulty. That's actually not true. The multi-state bar examiners have designed the test in a bell-shaped curve on a scale of difficulty from one at the easiest to 10 at the hardest. And if you think of about a bell-shaped curve, it means that most of the questions will be in the four, five, and six range of difficulty. Now this is significant because Along with this idea of structure that all of the exam questions are equally difficult comes another myth, which is that in some sense you must get extra credit for answering the harder questions, or more likely you're, you're really going to only succeed if you answer the hard questions. That is absolutely untrue. You can pass the bar exam and never get a question correct that's above a seven degree in difficulty. Now, that means you have to get all the ones, twos, and threes correct. In other words, you have to make the easy shots, and then you can get a few of the uh, tougher ones as you go along. The problem is that there's that part A, type A personality in many of us that says, oh, there's a really tough question. I'm going to really wrestle with that, as though somehow you get bonus points or style points for getting the tough questions correct. The truth is, it counts exactly the same as a uh, correct answer on a 10 question as it does on a one question. And the examiners have developed the exam with, as I say, a bell-shaped curve number of questions. So you have an equal number of questions that are designated one as are designated 10, twos and nines, threes and eights, and so on. So as a result, if you spend a disproportionate amount of your time either studying or on the exam itself trying to answer the very difficult questions, you are most likely giving up easy questions that you could be getting correct, and they count exactly the same. Now, I am stunned when I say this after 30 years that there are people that still don't know this, but in fact, there are a whole lot of folks out there in bar review provider land who just conveniently forget to talk about that. 
Why? Well, I think it's a lot easier to sell a course if you scare people and tell them you're gonna help them get all those really hard questions correct, or if you make it sound like every question on the bar exam is incredibly difficult. In fact, when I'm dealing with students uh, who are taking the bar exam for the first time, many of them comment on how easy most of the multi-state questions are, and they're correct. They are easy, and those are the ones you have to get right. How do you avoid uh, missing those? You don't overthink them. We'll talk about that in a moment. So that's the first thing in terms of understanding the test is not understanding the structure. The second related part of the uh, uh, understanding of the test is not understanding the scoring system. Now, as I've said, the questions all count the same, every one of them. There's no penalty for guessing. Some people don't understand that. But there's a huge penalty for guessing at the end because you've run out of time. And the reason for that is that the scoring and the structure of the exam make it such that very often easy questions are at the end of a morning session or at the end of an afternoon session. The questions you would have gotten right if you'd done them first become the ones you just guessed because you ran out of time. Now what the examiners have done in the last couple of years is to create a different structure for scoring. It used to be that 190 of the 200 questions counted towards your ultimate scaled score. That's no longer the case. Now it's 175 questions uh, out of the 200. What happened to the other 25 questions? They are evaluation questions. Now again, there's a lot of mythology here. Some people believe the evaluation questions are all put together in one block somewhere in the day. That's not true, they're spread out throughout the exam. There is no way of knowing which questions are evaluation questions and which ones are the real ones. Although if you see something that's totally bizarre and off the wall, it's a good bet it's an evaluation question. But the reality is that those evaluation questions are there to help the examiners get a marker on what questions to use in, in future exams. The 175 questions that count, however, are spread equally among the seven subjects. So it's an equal scoring of 25 on each. The importance of that is to recognize that if you are weak in a subject, you need to spend time working on that subject. That there are this, an equal amount of questions in every subject. So for most people, there are gonna be some things they like, some topics they like, and there are gonna be some that they really hate, but you have to spend time in all of them. They all count. You can't just say, I'm gonna give up on property and still pass the exam. It's most likely will not occur that way. Now, a lot of questions occurred when the examiners went from 190 questions to 175. People said, well, wait, I've got fewer opportunities now for my passing sc scaled score. But the word scaled was the important part here. What the examiners did is they shifted the scale to the right when they shifted uh, from 190 to 175 questions. In other words, if you're using, let's say, 135 as a passing scaled multi-state score, under the 190 question uh, scenario, that meant you probably needed to get on most exams around 123 to 126 questions raw correct. <clears throat> that was what the scale gave you, an additional number of points. Now, the scaling is not consistent and it is not constant over each exam. It's also on a scale. The scale is on a scale. And what that means is the fewer questions you get correct, the more scale points you get, and the more questions you get correct, the fewer scale points you get. So the sweet spot on the old exam was about 123 to about 126 or so uh, for that 135 number. Now, as the exam has moved down to 175 questions, the scale itself has shifted as well. Now to get the 135, you could actually drop down to about 119 to 122 and be in that same range. In other words, the examiners are not penalizing you because there are fewer questions available for you. In fact, they've continued to hold the scale about the same. So you're getting more scale points now than you would have gotten if you'd taken the exam a few years ago. This is important to understand because when you recognize that the scale is compensating for the fewer number of questions, it takes a lot of pressure off. I talk to way too many people who think that because there's 175 questions, now the pressure is really on. You got to get a much higher number of those correct to get your passing score. That is not true. You don't need to do that. The scale has shifted along with the scoring. And the third part of not understanding the test that I think is significant is fundamentally, People don't understand the purpose of the multi-state. So I decided it would be useful to kind of look at what the multi-state examiners themselves say uh, about uh, what the MBE is. And I thought that this was really interesting. Um, the, the examiners themselves say that the purpose of the multi-state is to assess the extent to which an examinee can apply fundamental legal principles and legal reasoning to analyze given fact patterns. 
Now notice what you didn't hear there. You did not hear the word memorization. You did not hear the word recitation. You did not hear the word elements. None of that was there. I think it's important to recognize that being able to be successful on the exam comes from using your legal skills, not your memorization skills. And I'm surprised how often people make this mistake. Now, I've got to tell you, I'm pleased that even some of the big box bar reviews have finally gotten around to saying on their websites, hey, the MBE is not really about memorization. But you know, for years and years, decades, literally, that's what they taught. And in fact, there are courses that have made their entire living off of this idea of you can just memorize and beat the law cold or crush the law or, you know, uh, you know, uh, be the master of the MBE or whatever it is, you know. Um, and, and the reality for those students is that when they try to do that, they get into a world of trouble. Uh, they misunderstand the purpose of the test. If you recognize that you're really being tested on your analytical abilities, then it seems to me that that would change the way you study, wouldn't it? If you were being tested on if you could memorize the elements, I would put my time and energy into memorization. I'd go take a memorization course. I'd learn every mnemonic trick in the book. Oh wait, that's what a lot of bar reviews do. But the reality of the test is something entirely different. It's based on seeing uh, fundamental principles and then seeing how they apply and identifying them. And that comes from a whole different place of learning and understanding. So if you don't understand the purpose of the multi-state, it's very difficult to be successful. I describe it as something like trying to hit a pinata, you know, the game where they blindfold you and give you a stick and you hit the, the donkey with the candy in it. But while you're being spun around, the donkey gets moved to another room. It doesn't matter how hard you swing your stick, you're not going to hit anything. And for a lot of bar takers, particularly repeat bar takers, they try to double down on this idea of memorization and recitation when they failed the multi-state and that takes them further away from their goal, not getting them closer. So that's the first reason that I think people fail the multi-state. They don't understand the test. And look, if you really don't understand the test, um, there's a link on our, our site. You can set up a conference with me. I will be glad to talk with you about it and answer your questions. And frankly, if you're in another course and they haven't answered your, your questions, shame on them, because this is all common material that everybody should know. All right, second reason why you failed your multi-state is that you didn't study properly. And this is where we get a little more dicey, to be sure. Um, I think that the first thing that's important to point out is that I don't meet many people who fail the multi-state because they failed to study. That is, they were lazy, they didn't put in the effort. I think that speaks for itself. If you don't put in the time and effort, yeah, you're gonna have trouble. But that's not really who I'm talking to here. <clears throat> I wanna talk to those of you that put in a lot of time and a lot of effort, and you see your multi-state score staying the same or falling backwards. Why might that happen? Well, the first reason, in my view, is what I just talked about. You're putting your focus on memorization. This is such a deeply held myth about the bar exam that it doesn't matter how often I say it, how often we talk about it, how many times we point it out, how many sources we cite to, it is just one of those immutable beliefs that somehow gets grown out of law school and then perpetuated by uh, people in the legal field. Uh, oftentimes, bar, uh, law professors who don't know anything about the bar exam um, but certainly bar review courses that tell you that what you should be doing is spending most of your time memorizing. How do they do that? <clears throat> they tell you to make flashcards. They tell you to recite mnemonics. Um, I've seen some brand new bar reviews that, that put great weight in their own ability to create mnemonics for you. Why? Why would you want to do that? There's no reason. There's no value to it. It's not what the test is actually prepping you on, but it's clever marketing, and so it's what's being done. If you are spending your time memorizing, making outlines and checklists and flashcards and highlighting and reciting elements, um, here's a newsflash. You're most likely going to fail the exam. The test doesn't reward that behavior. So if you've been studying on the basis of memorization, then I think you've got a problem. Now, I'm going to give you what I think is a better alternative in a moment. But I want to be clear that memorization is not the path. You know, the screen behind me, if you're watching the video, I've got a, a, a labyrinth, a maze behind me. And I think for most people, trying to memorize the bar uh, for the MBE feels like that maze or labyrinth. You just get locked into one dead end after another. It's not a successful methodology. If you have been a memorization-focused uh, student, this is the primary reason, in my view, that you're failing the exam. 
Along with that is that students who study uh, put too much focus on the elements of the law. That is, they try to figure out all of the key uh, points or elements of each black letter rule of law as though somehow knowing those elements will translate to success on the exam. That is not what's going on here. The examiners are testing legal skills and the legal skill is not knowing all of the elements. It's seeing how the law is applied to a particular fact pattern and then making a quick decision about that. If you're spending your time trying to learn all of the elements because you've been told that the multi-state is a deeply substantive test, you're missing the boat. It's not about the elements, it's about the process, it's about the patterns that you see. And the patterns are repeated over and over and over again. So for those of you that spend your time trying to learn all of the elements of negligence or all of the elements of anything, I would tell you that you're wasting an extraordinary amount of time and a lot of mental energy that's not gonna pay you much of a dividend. I know that's hard to hear. The third reason that I think students don't study properly is that they focus way too much on details. It is easy to get lost in the weeds on questions and on the studying for the multi-state. You can get so caught up in nuance and in creating your own uh, hypotheticals from hell that you really miss out on the key of what's going on in the exam itself. You get too locked into the details and you fail to step back and look at the big picture. And often in a multi-state question, there is a big picture to answer first, and then there's some refinement of that big picture. But for far too many students, they get way too locked into the details. They start reading words in the question and then trying to analyze word by word or analyzing words in answer choices and trying to parse those in great detail. Look, if you've been spending your time in the details of the multi-state, you're most likely not successful. And the more effort you put in at the detail level, again, it's counterintuitive, you will actually get lower scores. The exam simply doesn't reward that behavior. That is not what we're looking for in lawyers, is being highly detail uh, uh, about the law. The law is available to you when you're practicing all the time. It's right there in front of you. You don't need the details and the elements. You don't need the memorization. So those are three things that certainly, uh, I think, confuse people with their study. The, the fourth thing in terms of studying properly is that uh, a lot of people uh, veer to an extreme when it comes to practice questions. They either don't do enough practice questions or they rely on them too heavily. Now, here's the thing about practice questions. First of all, you gotta know what questions you're working with. There are only a certain number of licensed actual multi-state bar questions, and there are only a certain number of licensed bar exam providers that have those questions. Celebration Bar Review is one of them. We've had them for uh, 25 plus years now. But a lot of the big box companies don't use licensed questions. Why? The royalties are really expensive. It would be a, a huge expense for them, and so they write their own questions. Now, you might argue that they're good at writing questions, but they're not the same as the questions the bar examiners write. And that means you're working with a different set of materials. So if you are relying on questions from your big box bar review or a bar review that doesn't have licensed questions for whatever reason, you're at a substantial disadvantage to students that are working with real questions. But even if you're taking a course with licensed questions, there's another part of this that you need to consider, and that is the quality of the answer explanations. Now, the National Conference has put out a few very brief answer explanations for some of their questions, but for all of the questions that they've released, they have not done that. And their answer explanations are less than enlightening, to be honest. Um, so how do you get good answer explanations? Well, in our case, uh, our course started actually at the Harvard Law School in the 1970s when the multi-state first came out. And we are the successor to a company uh, that developed a fabulous multi-state course uh, back in its day. It was SMH Bar Review. Part of what we did back then was to put our editors in a room. Uh, we didn't lock the, the door and keep the key, but we had them work on questions, dissecting them, uh, detailing them, and finding out what the essential nutshell of the law was that controlled the answer to that question. Now that was important because once we understood what the principle was that controlled the question, we could then draft answer explanations for all four answer choices that explained why one answer was better than the others. Now over the 50 years that we've had questions and been doing that work, uh, as we took over Celebration Bar Review nearly three decades ago, we've continued that process. Our editors spend extraordinary amounts of time analyzing and revising answers to questions. As a result, our question uh, answer explanations, I think are the very best in the bar review industry. 
And I constantly talk to people who've taken other courses who say, well, I did the questions and they were licensed questions, but when I missed a question, I couldn't figure out why I missed it. I didn't understand why. It said A is better than B, C, and D, but it didn't tell me why. And the explanations for B, C, and D just told me what was in answer choice A. That's not very helpful. And so if you've been relying on a course that doesn't give you good answer explanations, it's certainly not gonna help your performance on the exam. It's necessary for you to see the distinctions between answer choices in order to discern the patterns in the questions because the patterns are what make a difference. So a couple of things here with your studies. First, I think you should be using licensed questions. Secondly, you should be using questions that have good answer explanations. But then I also wanna throw in this caveat. I've talked to lots of people who tell me that their study approach is they're just gonna do practice questions. I don't think that's appropriate at all. We use a three-legged stool approach, which is to have you read, then do lectures, then do practice questions, and we do it over a period of time in what we call spaced repetition. For far too many students, what goes away is the reading and the lecture, and they just do practice questions and they cram. That isn't gonna do it. And if the quality of the questions or the quality of the answers is not high, it's definitely not gonna do it for you at all. So you have to use the questions properly in the context of a complete course, and you've got to make sure you've got good questions. In talking about why people don't study properly, I also wanted to offer you some suggestions about what I think is proper study. I've already talked about one of those items. It's the learning methodology called spaced repetition. Spaced repetition is the preferred uh, modality for teaching and learning across the United States today in higher education, everywhere except in law schools, uh, and maybe a few medical schools. The idea of spaced repetition is, is really quite simple. You take a body of material, you expose a student to it, and then you take it away for a short while. Then you return the student back to the material, and now you add a new layer to that material, and then you pull it away again. Then you bring it back a third time, and you add a new layer, and you continue doing that, creating a stair-step effect. The value of spaced or stepped repetition is that the brain seems to learn more effectively through repetition than through memorization and it learns in small chunks. So as you incrementally add information, you gain a knowledge and a substantial foundation in what you already had been, um, uh, uh, had already been exposed to you. And it's an extraordinary learning system. Now we've used spaced repetition exclusively since we started Celebration Bar Review. Most Bar Review courses don't even know what it is, and almost all of them go the other direction towards memorization and cramming. But in test after test, across every uh, intellectual uh, discipline, spaced repetition has out consistently outperformed any other form of learning. Now, I was very fortunate to do my studies with Howard Gardner at Harvard. He created multiple intelligences as a learning theory, and he is a proponent of spaced repetition. We use it consistently in our course because we see that it helps people learn without taking time to memorize. So if you've been trying to memorize, as I said, there is an alternative, it's called spaced repetition. It's much more comfortable and it's actually deeper learning. Along with that deeper learning, we offer a couple of different tools that we think make a big difference. Many of you who are longtime listeners of my uh, podcasts or watch our videos know that I talk about and use and recommend a, a tool called photo reading. Photo reading is a whole mind reading system. It was developed by Dr. Paul Sheely uh, in Minnesota about 30 some years ago. And we've been teaching in the Bar Review for well over a decade. We've seen enormous jumps in our students' uh, multi-state scores when they photo read. Photo reading allows you to absorb material uh, into the non-conscious mind at a much faster rate, about 25,000 words a minute. The traditional reader in law reads at about 110 words a minute. So you can see it's a wildly different uh, approach. It's not speed reading, it's really reading into a different part of the brain and then extracting that information at a deeper, more uh, intuitive level. Now to help get at that deeper intuitive level, we match photo reading with a note-taking style called mind mapping. And many of you have probably been familiar with mind maps or use them perhaps in uh, some part of your, your studies or note-taking or uh, business life. Mind mapping is an enormously effective way to visually represent the notes that you're taking. So the way that this all comes together is that we suggest to our students that they photo read an outline many, many times. A traditional bar review outline would take most people eight to 10 hours to read in a normal fashion. Our photo readers can read that same outline in 15 minutes. As a result, our photo readers will read a bar review subject outline 50 to 100 times before the bar exam. 
and that's enormous. And then we will activate that material through specially designed audio and video lectures. These lectures are designed to highlight what you just read into the non-conscious mind. We then cement that in place by uh, directing you into making mind maps, visual representations of the material that you photo read and now watched or heard in the lecture. And then we finish that by doing a uh, selective, I'm sorry, uh, spaced repetition uh, to answer multiple choice questions. So the process works like this. Photo read, lecture, mind map, questions. Photo read again, then listen to the lecture at an even higher speed, then mind map again, then more questions in the same subject and repeat that over and over. The net result is that you will have a deeper, better understanding of the law. And we prove this every year when we do our live boot camp. We literally give students uh, questions uh, cold, and then we test them after photo reading, and then we test them again after a lecture, and then we test them again uh, after they've created a mind map. And we routinely see uh, students getting 70, 80% or more correct on material that they'd never seen before. So the reality is that you can change the way you study for the multi-state uh, by doing these uh, relatively simple and, and not very expensive uh, steps that can change the way you study. All right, so just to recap so far, why do people fail the MBE? First, because they don't understand the test. Secondly, as a result of not understanding the test, they don't study properly. They don't take advantage of these tools that would be more effective. Here's the third reason why people fail the multi-state. They don't take the test itself properly. They don't take the test properly. Here's what I mean by that. Way too many people come into the multi-state exam attempting to use brute force. They decide that they're going to figure out uh, every answer to every question. Every question to them is a killer question and everyone has to be wrestled to the ground. That is entirely 180 degrees the wrong approach to take. The better approach to take to the multi-state is much more zen. It's much more uh, a matter of letting the test come to you. And what I mean by that is that instead of trying to fight your way through every question, we use a technique that we've trademarked called selective intuition. Selective intuition says that instead of skipping all over the exam, you literally will go from question one to question 100. You don't try and jump around it. You don't try to analyze the degree of difficulty. You just start with the first question. As you're reading the question, the goal of selective intuition is first to preform an answer in your mind. In other words, to get the big picture. Should the plaintiff win or the defendant win? Should the injunction be granted or not? Whatever the question is basically asking you in its broadest form. As you begin to preform that answer, you then go down to the answer choices and you look to see if your answer is identified as one of the four. If it is, you mark it and forget it. You just go on. You don't try to figure out, well, maybe I overthought that or maybe there was something else or maybe there was a better answer than that one. Nope, you just mark it and forget it and move on. Now, if you don't see your preformed answer in those answer choices, you read all four answer choices, but then under selective intuition, what you do is literally take a moment, close your eyes, and you open your eyes again, what answer do you see? And that's the answer you take. And you might say, well, why in the world would you do that? Why wouldn't you try to figure it out? Well, the reason is that whether or not you're in our course or not, whether you're a photo reader or using mind maps or not, your non-conscious brain works for you, even if you take the big box bar review. And your non-conscious brain knows the answer to this material. As long as you studied, it's there. The problem is most of us don't listen to our non-conscious brain. We let our conscious brain do the work. We've memorized and crammed and recited and done elements. And while we're so busy trying to figure that out, our non-conscious is back in the corner waving its arms saying, hey, I know the answer. We say, no, no, I'm too busy trying to figure out the answer to listen to you. And the result is that people then talk themselves out of right answers. If you don't believe me, just go back and think about when you've taken tests. How many times have you narrowed down to two answer choices, selected one, and then talk yourself out of it. <clears throat> in other words, talk yourself out of what you knew the right answer probably was. It happens far more frequently than people realize, and it's a big problem. So with selective intuition, you avoid that problem entirely. You're really drawing on what you've learned. You're drawing on the patterns that you've seen. You're drawing on your analysis and your analytical ability. You're drawing, if you're in our course, on your photo reading and the mind mapping and the practice questions that you've done. All of that comes together and gives you the ability to do the question in a much more effective and efficient way. And you don't get into the details. You don't try to compare is A better than C. That is not the process at all. So that is a radically different way of taking the test. We do not teach our students to compare answer choices against each other. It's simply read and then respond. 
And when you respond, you get better results, time after time after time after time. Now, along with this comes one additional benefit that most people don't realize in, uh, when they start in, and that is that your timing changes completely. If you're trying to analyze every question, the odds are good that you're either going to be rushed for time or not finish the 100 questions in the allotted three hours. It's just simply impossible to break down those fine line distinctions for 200 questions or 100 questions in every session and still get them all done. As a result, many bar takers go in and start working uh, at the end to, to Christmas tree or just line up all of their uh, answers and they mark them all one letter or they do something uh, that's not much more than a guess. That's not effective at all. As we talked about, many times the easiest questions in the exam are deliberately placed at the end of a session. In our course, we teach our students to answer a question in 90 seconds. That's it. And you might say, why 90 seconds? Well, in our studies, we found there's a sweet spot. Most people get the right answer at about 90 to 100 seconds. After about 120 seconds or two minutes, the answer choice uh, probability declines significantly. And I've talked about that in other places. I won't belabor the point here. I simply want to point out that when you're using selective intuition, 90 seconds is plenty of time and it gives you a half an hour of additional time. What do you use that half an hour for? Well, if you're old like me, you go to the bathroom. But a lot of people use it for pit stops, rests, breaks, put their head down, uh, take a breath, uh, stretch themselves, uh, do the things that take away the pressure of having to get through the exam in three hours. So if you're having trouble on the multi-state, one of the reasons, almost certainly, is you're spending too long on too many questions. 90 seconds, every question, start to finish. That's the way to be successful. And then the final thing that I wanna say about why you failed the multi-state, if you're a repeat bar taker, probably if it, boil, boils, it all boils down to one thing, and that is you keep repeating the same errors. And I don't mean the same errors in terms of knowing the law. You know, for some of us, we're never gonna know the rule against perpetuities, it just doesn't matter. The, the smart student, however, is the one that sees a rule against perpetuities question and goes, yeah, I, it's A, I'm gonna mark it and go on and not waste my time on it. But what I mean by repeating the same errors is that far too many students simply continue to study, to prepare, and to take the test in the same way. And that simply won't work. The reason I say this with such confidence is that the multi-state examiners themselves have pointed out that they work to provide consistent outputs for consistent inputs. In other words, they standardize the test now over 50 years, 100 administrations of the exam, they know this test really well. It is highly standardized, probably one of the best tests in the world when it comes to standardization. And their, their position is that a student who prepares the same way and approaches the exam the same way should get the same score regardless of when they took the test. 1972, 2020, doesn't matter, same result. And they're very proud of that. And I think rightfully so. The bad news for you as a bar taker is that that standardization really beats you up. If you've been failing the exam and you're studying the same way and you think to yourself, I'll just study a little harder, I'll memorize a little bit more, I'll do more flashcards, I'll learn more elements, I'll analyze more questions, you will get roughly the same result. In fact, then because of decay, you'll actually start to see your scores go down, and that's really frustrating to people. Look, if you are a repeat bar taker and you have seen your multi-state scores level out or drop, it's not your fault. The only fault is that you're doing the same thing and you've got to do something different. And that's so hard to get people out of that mindset. They think to themselves, well, I'll use an algorithm bar review course, or I'll use a course that's got uh, mnemonics, or I'll do something. No, those things aren't going to change. If the fundamentals of what you're doing still rely on memorization, recitation, cramming, and analysis of each question, you will continue to get the same score. Now, for roughly a, a bit more than half of the first-time bar takers in the country, that's enough to pass the exam. I wouldn't be real proud of that number if I were the big box bar reviews, but it's an okay number. But for those people that didn't pass, you need to recognize as quickly as possible that you're on the wrong track. And the only way you're going to move that multi-state number up is to have the courage to make a change. You know, the only thing that doesn't make sense is doing the same thing over again and expecting a different result. And that's why people fail the MBE. Now, if you'd like to know more about what you can do to change all of that, we'd love to talk to you. There's a, a link to consult with me. I'd love to talk with you about your studies, analyze your scores, and show you a better way to study. 
I'm confident that we can help anyone pass the multi-state if they simply uh, engage in these things we've talked about. They learn to understand the test, they learn how to study properly, they take the test properly, and they don't keep repeating the same errors. Do that and you can pass the multi-state bar exam.